Stacy Spencer and Rhonda Spencer. We are elated and excited to talk to you today. And we've got an important topic. I want to ask a question right off the bat. What's the question? Why can't pastors talk about sex? Hmm, that's a really good question. We want you to tune into this podcast because there are a lot of uncomfortable people that have talked to me lately and said, Pastor, I just don't want to hear you talk about sex. And I asked our coach about this and uh, she said, why not? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't pastors be able? Don't you think if you want to be spiritually whole and sexually whole and physically whole that you will want? The person watches over your soul to talk about that. We're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, and so you're tuning in in the right place at the right time for the right reason. Let's have a discussion, y'all. And so, baby, I want to jump right in. And I was talking to um, a, a church member the other day. They were having marital problems and it went unchecked for a long time. And I said, have y'all been listening to our podcast mm -hmm. around sexuality and marriage? And the person said, well, my spouse doesn't want to hear their pastor talk about sex. And I'm like, huh? I had sort of that Scooby-Doo look, you mm -hmm. know, like, huh? Um, and I went to our coach who's teaching us, you know, we're being certified as sexologists in the church. And I said, why is it that people don't want to hear? She said, why not? She said, well, seeing that if you are looking after their well-being, and you are their spiritual leader, you should have that room to say something. So I want to ask you and ask y'all listening tonight or listening on this podcast, why is it that people don't want to hear from their pastor about sex? What do you think, babe? I think there's kind of like a, a dissociation between your pastor telling you about, you know, the things in the Bible, you know, how to live right on the spiritual side of it. But they don't want us in their bedroom, mm. not physically in your bedroom. I don't want to come in there either way. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes mentally in your bedroom. I get it. I get it. There's this false dichotomy that exists between the spiritual and the physical mm -hmm. or the spiritual and the carnal. And I think that goes back to the days of colonization. Okay. When we were taken from the shores of Africa, there was no distinction between the spiritual and the physical there was this in, in integration of the spirit and the physical. We sang songs of worship in the field. When you go to Ghana, you see Praise the Lord gas station or Thank You Jesus grocery store. There, there is this integration of the spiritual in, in all that we do. And even as it relates to sensuality. But when we were taken on slave ships and brought over, there was this false doctrine of separation from spirit and flesh that was infused upon us and we were taught to be ashamed of our bodies. Right. Uh, and, and the schizophrenia of it all is that slave masters would impose these strict restrictions, this puritanistic faith upon black bodies, but then turn around and rape black bodies, you know, in right. the woods right. and, uh, and, and turn male African-American males into breeders and strip them from their families while raping their women and the men felt powerless and were emasculated. That same kind of, of fault has been passed down through a bootleg Christianity that separates Christianity and sensuality. And I think we have to rescue our pleasure. We have to resist this thought that there's this false separation. Jesus told us, he said, you should love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your mind, and all, all your soul, uh, mind, body, and soul. So if Jesus recognizes that we are one in all those areas, I'm pretty sure he's okay mm -hmm. with us expressing ourselves sexually within the boundaries of what God calls right. Right. When God created Adam and Eve, he's, the Bible says he created them and they were what? Naked and without shame. Talk about that shame part. The shame came in the Bible with Adam and Eve once they ate from the forbidden tree. Um, before that, they didn't have any shame. No shame. Um, but the shame could also be uh, where, where we try to have, you know, compartmentalize our lives, mm, right? Mm. Where when we were at church, we're just talking about church. Now, church doesn't necessarily mean the body, but when you're around 
we at the people are the church, but we don't want, sometimes we don't want or seemingly want our pastor to talk about every aspect of our life, mm. whether that's in the Bible, whether that's finances or even our sexuality. Uh, so a lot of people may have some shame associated around sex because of some things in the past that have taken place or even how you were brought up, you know, in your own family of origin. We need to unpack a lot of what you say. You said some really good stuff. Okay. You talked about shame and you talked about compartmentalization. Okay. Let's go back to shame. Okay. And we're going to come back to compartmentalization. Okay. <laughs> so the shame, if you go back to the original story of God creating Adam and Eve, they were naked and without shame. Right. I mean, just imagine they're walking around the garden naked, no leaves covering them. They are naked. The sun is kissing their skin. They, they have no idea that they're naked until the serpent comes into the garden right. and says, you know, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat from that forbidden tree is because you, he's afraid you're going to be like him. Mm -hmm. And they started entertaining that thought that they were missing out on something. You know, we all have that FOMO, right. fear of missing out. Right. They felt like they were missing out on something, even though they had everything. And when they capitulated to the temptation of Satan, that's when the shame came in and they tried to hide from God by putting leaves on them. Correct. And God said, Adam, where are you? He said, we hid because we were naked. And God asked an important question. Who, who told, told you that you, you were naked? naked? And that's what I want to ask y'all. Who told y'all that? Who told you, you were, who told you being naked was wrong? It is a Western thought that breast exposed breasts are sinful. When you go to Africa, there are tribes of people who women do not wear tops, right? Because uh, when we went to Africa, you remember we visited Africa, we saw a woman breastfeeding and we asked, is it okay to breastfeed in public? And they said, we're not, it's not taboo to say a woman's breast out in Africa. We are more infatuated sexually with the woman's behind. And so we, we expect them to cover that but not so much the breast. So these cultural nuances change once we got to America mm -hmm. and the shame part came in. And, and because people have been miseducated around the area of sexuality, there's so much shame attached to it. The church has been notorious for telling people what not to do, but we have not told the church what they can do in terms of their sexuality. The disciples of Christ have this mantra that says, where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. Well, have you read about sex in the Bible? Yes. In multiple places, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yes. We, we read in the Old Testament. Oh, my God. In, in the Old Testament, there are stories plastered with sexuality. When we think about Ruth and Boaz, when Ruth goes and lays at the feet mm -hmm. of Boaz, um, she is not laying at his literal feet. The word feet in Hebrew means genitals. She's laying at his genitals. When we read about, oh my goodness, uh, Hosea the prophet, when God tells him to go marry a prostitute as a sign of what Israel has done to him in playing the prostitute, he literally went and married a prostitute. Uh, when you think about Judah, um, one of the tribes of Israel, Judah um, was supposed to give his youngest son to his daughter, but she had already married two of his sons who died prematurely and he hid the youngest son. And so she dressed up as a prostitute and went and stood by the city gate. He slept with her, got her pregnant, and then wanted to kill her when he found out she was pregnant, but didn't know she was dressed up as a prostitute. And when they told her that the staff belonged to Judah, he said, she's more righteous than I. And then you have a whole Psalms that's dedicated and very descriptive about sex. Song of Solomon. The yes. whole book is one of the most erotic books yeah. of the Bible. Yeah. And yet we have people saying to us, I don't want my parents to talk about sex because we have allowed this diluted, sanitized, uh, shame version of sexuality to be taught to us by our colonizers. And we have to go back and rescue ourselves. So let's go back to compartmentalization. All right. So maybe help people understand, culturally speaking, why black folk don't allow people to sit in their living room. Culturally speaking, my black people don't want. <laughs> you know, remember grandmama had that one room with the plastic on it and you couldn't go in that room? Oh, well, that room because it was uncomfortable. So it was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable. Why? Because there's plastic over this. But is that why she said you couldn't go in there? 
because she wanted it to keep it nice. She wanted to preserve it. Yeah. Oh my God. Come on. She grandmama wanted to preserve that furniture. Right. So much so that you couldn't sit on the furniture. And if you did. You got in trouble and your skin stuck to the yes. plastic when it was hot absolutely it wasn't comfortable mm -mm. and that's what we have done to sexuality made it uncomfortable we have made it uncomfortable we have made it a subject that cannot be approached you can look in it but don't talk about it mm -hmm. look but don't tell you know what i'm saying that's what sex has become in the church you can go we can talk about worship we can talk about sports we can talk about this but no, mm -mm, we're not going to talk about the bedroom. The bedroom, I think, is off limits. But the Apostle Paul tells us that the bed is undefiled and the marriage is able to handle all of the sexual desires. And we have to rescue sexuality back from the world. Mm -hmm. Sex does not was not a gift to the world. It was a gift to, to God's children, right? He told us to go be fruitful and multiply. Well, the only way to be fruitful is to have sex. Absolutely. And sex is supposed to be pleasurable. Uh, the Apostle Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, do not deny each other except by mutual consent. How important is it for spouses to satisfy each other sexually? And do you think God is concerned about it? Of course, God's concerned about it. But spouses need to be with each other because that's a way of one of the ways for connection. Talk about that. Uh, you know, connection, you being one, um, you're sharing the same space, uh, you're, you're actually helping each other release, you know, serotonin and all oxytocin. oxytocin. So all those things are so important in a marriage to become closer together. For this reason, a man shall what? Leave, Leave his, his mother and father and cleave, cleave to only his, to his wife. Yes. That word cleave in, in the Hebrew language means that there is a fusion, there is a connection, and sex is how we fuse. Our emotions become one. Our heartbeats become syncopated. There is a chemical release of bonding that takes place when we have sex. Mm -hmm. And it is a natural and spiritual function of which God has ordained. When the Bible talks about sexual immorality, that sexual immoral people will burn in hell. We have taken that and used it out of context because right. sexual immorality as defined by the Bible is sex outside the covenant relationship of a marriage. So if it's outside of marriage where sexual immorality comes in, what about within the boundaries of marriage? There's so much freedom. I, I remember when we got married, uh, you know, there was part of me was like, oh my gosh, the ball and chain, I'm gonna lose my freedom. But when I got married, what I discovered is there's so much more freedom within the boundaries of our relationship. And I had allowed the world to define to me and my false understanding of my faith to define that there would be restrictions in doing it God's way. Yeah, that's holy, mm -hmm. totally from a colonizer standpoint mm -hmm. of thinking, and some even joke by putting a ball and chain on, on the spouse's, on the husband's leg. But I think also why a lot of individuals don't want your pa their pastor to talk about sex is because they don't always see him as human. Oh, uh, come on with it. They don't always see, they, they want to put him on a pedestal and not make him flesh and blood uh, with the spouse and like, oh no, I can't think about my, my, my pastor as being. But it ain't human. just me. They look at you like that too. I can't think about my pastor <laughs> or his wife, my first I, lady. I my first lady, she's so pristine. She's like the mother of Jesus. But how did I get three boys <laughs> through sex? So that I didn't have, you know, artificial <laughs> insemination or anything. Or immaculate conception. Oh, no, I was not married. But I think that is an issue where they want to put you on a pedestal, not making you human and thinking that, oh, you don't have the same arousal or tendencies that humans have. And I think as pastors, we set ourselves up for failure. when We capitulate to the demands of these stereotypical uh, images that people try to impose upon us. That's why it's important for me to always be authentically me. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, I'm the same person. Whether yes. you see me at Walmart or and at I the am church, too. I'm the same I way. don't have time to... 
to flip it and try to switch it. So I'm going to be authentic in the sense that I love God mm -hmm. and I love sex. I love God. I love my wife and I love being with my wife. I love pleasing my wife. And I want other marriages to benefit from the pleasure that God has ordained. And I don't see nothing wrong with that. I don't need that. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with trying to help people discover the richness and the deepness of the passion and love that is available. God wants us to have pleasure. The Bible says that he wants to give us our heart's desire. He wants us to have a good marriage. He hates divorce. And part of divorce proofing your marriage is that you got to have a great sex life. OK, so let's let's flip the switch. Let's say I'm single and I don't want to hear my pastors talking about what married people do because that's making me feel bad because I'm single. Why does it make you feel bad, single person? Well, because <laughs> in the Bible, it's saying that sex is supposed to be between mutual consent between a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. And so when I don't have a husband or a wife, you're making me feel bad. You know, what's crazy is that in the Song of Solomon, they're not married. I know. Okay. They're, they're talking about my lover this, my lover mm -hmm. that. And the reality is that single people, y'all having sex. Um, and so we're trying to discuss what a healthy sex life looks like within the boundaries of a covenant relationship mm -hmm. and a covenant relationship is a relationship where there is exclusivity that god has brought you together what god has brought together let no man or woman take asunder there is so much to discover within the the boundaries of a covenant relationship and all we're trying to do is to show you what a healthy relationship looks like in a covenant relationship it's not to shame you it's not to make you feel less than because watch this you got to be successfully single before you can be married correct and so i we want to help you to understand what a healthy sexuality looks like so that if you choose to get married then singleness is a gift mm -hmm. the apostle paul says this that being single is a gift that not everybody has he says, but if you cannot control your sexual passions, it's better to marry than it is to burn with passion. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we chose to get married because we wanted to honor God with our passions, with our sexuality. And within those boundaries, we enjoy our sex life. We have a wonderful sex life. And so it's not to make any anybody to disparage any single people. But I hope that our conversations that you hear can help you in the in the context of a covenant relationship. I agree. Does that make sense? It makes perfect so, sense. And here's another reason I think people trip out when they hear us talking about sex, because a lot of y'all see your pastors, your first lady as your mom and daddy. And <laughs> we've learned from experience that our children do not want to hear <laughs> <laughs> about their mom and daddy having sex. When we kiss in the kitchen or they are around and we kiss, stop. And they're, tw they're in their 20s. Right. And they still like, oh, can y'all stop it? How in the heck do you think you got here? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you don't want to hear. But what has stunted us, if you think natural, First, what has stunted many of us when we when we do workshops, baby, we ask people, how many of your parents have talked to you about sex? What's the response? Very little. It's, it's very few individuals whose parents have sat down and talked to There's them about a very small sex. percentage very small. of people whose parents have had a healthy discussion with them about sex. There's a very small percentage of believers whose pastors have talked to them about sex. And as a result of that, we got dirty deacons having sex with women wow. in the church and birthing babies. We got girls with 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 blouses buttoned up to their neck and skirts down to their ankles who are having babies out of wedlock because their sexuality has been repressed and expresses itself in dysfunctional, sneaky ways. Mm -hmm. And they have split off dark shadow passions because nobody has given them a safe place to talk about sexuality. So I think it's important that spiritual parents talk about sex, oh, don't absolutely. you? And and when and not saying like when we talk to our boys, they know because we have a very open and honest communication with them. And so that's what we're doing with you guys. We want to have that open, 
honest communication, all of it, the do's, the don'ts, the highs, the lows, every part of it, because you just are not going to get one part of us. You're going to get the totality of who we are. You know, I remember writing our first book about naked and unashamed back in 2007, I think. Um, and it was received with mixed reviews. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a good group of people like, finally, thank you for sharing. We needed to hear this kind of information. This is helping me. And then this local DJ, Talking Head, uh, got a hold of it and tried to sensationalize it and only emphasize the end of the book where we were talking about certain techniques. They skipped past the theology, skipped past the scripture, and went straight to the techniques. And that's the only thing that got lifted up. And we were drugged through the mud for about a month. Uh, lost some church members because they were embarrassed that they had to defend their pastor. Fast forward to 2022, mm -hmm. and there's still, we've evolved, we've changed, we've grown. And there are a lot more people who are saying, thank you, we need this. And there's less people saying, I don't want to hear my pastor talk about sex. But I thought it was worthy of mentioning tonight why people don't want to hear from their pastors. Mm -hmm. Because, y'all, these are conversations that we need to have. Absolutely. If we're going to break the stigma of shame off of the church, if we're going to embrace people who want to clarity and want community around their sexuality and find a healthy definition of what healthy sexuality looks like concerning God. Don't you think the church needs to be the first place to talk about that? We have run so many of our millennials off, our young people off <clears throat> because of our restrictive theology around sexuality. We're not inclusive. We don't embrace people. You got young people committing suicide. <clears throat> because they're they're not they don't have a safe place to go talk about their sexuality. The church ought to be that safe place where people can come. I remember when Jesus was trying to be <clears throat> tricked by the religious people of his day, the Pharisees. When they, you remember that story when they caught the woman in adultery, right? Tell that story. What happened? Um, they caught the woman in adultery. They did what? They caught the they woman. They caught her. They caught her, which means, how did you catch her? Because you, <laughs> you look at, right? <laughs> you, you, you know, it wasn't after the fact. But at any rate, they caught the woman mm -hmm. in adultery. Um, they brought her, I guess, to the center of town or whatever. And they were like, we're going to stone this woman. The woman, not the they man. They said, the law says that a woman who's caught in adultery is to be stoned to death. Jesus, what do you say? And what did Jesus do? Jesus said, what did he do first? He first, he started writing everybody. He was writing in the sand. Uh -huh. And it is thought that he is writing the names of those who probably was with the, the lady or have been sinning themselves. Yep. And so he was writing the names in the sand. And then he asked them, those without sin cast the first stone. You better preach. And then what happened? And after... I'm assuming they looked and was like, ah, you know, I've done this. Oh, mm. that's my name. Mm. I can't throw this stone mm. because if I throw the stone, they're going to think, oh, well, no, I remember you did X, Y, Z. Somebody else may have come and said something. So they, everybody, there's no one there that threw a stone. They said they left from the oldest to the youngest, to the youngest. They all left. They all Jesus left. looks at the woman. He says, woman, is there anybody left to condemn you? And she said, and there was not. And, and she he, said, no. And he said, go and, and sin, sin no, no more. more. Neither do I condemn you. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If Jesus could forgive a woman caught in adultery, don't you think he can forgive us when we mess up in whatever area we mess up? What's crazy about Christians is that we judge people because their sin is different than ours. Mm. And all of us have to get to a place where we have a sexual, a healthy sexual worldview that's centered in scripture. What does the Bible say about how health, how healthy sex looks like in a covenant relationship? I believe we got to unpack it. I think we got to debunk some of these sexual myths that sex is dirty, that sex is nasty. It is a gift from God. Absolutely. And we've got to rescue it. Our kids deserve it. Oh, absolutely. And so we as adults, we have the responsibility to 
teach our children correctly about sex mm -hmm. and, and not just put your child on birth control, your daughter, and, and give your son a box of condoms. It goes further than that. Tell them why not. And also tell them all the things that's going on in the world as to why it may be okay for them to save themselves. I remember telling my our sons, um, I said, when you're dating a young lady, when you're single in your youth, I want you to date that young lady and treat her like you would want somebody to treat your future wife. So that made my sons think, how do I want, because when, you, when you're single again, when you're dating, everybody you date is not going to be your spouse. Right. You're dating somebody else's spouse. Mm -hmm. So how do you want somebody to treat your spouse? And I think that makes us think twice about having one night stands or dogging somebody out or using people or manipulating people because you wouldn't want somebody to treat your spouse that way, your future spouse. So our point tonight was your pastor should be able to talk about sex and y'all should listen because we have been through some things that we don't want you to have to repeat. We It took us a long time to get to this space where we're naked and without shame. We went through some ups, some downs, some life lessons, some heartache, and we just want to avoid some of that heartache and to share with you some of the principles we've learned. Mm -hmm. Principles right. we've learned through prayer, through heart, through trial and error, through educating ourselves, through enlighten, being enlightened, uh, through study. We want to help you. And, and there's two, a couple of ways we want to help. So for those of you who are in a covenant relationship, in a marriage already, we have what's called the Eden Circle. Mm -hmm. And Eden Circle uh, gives you coaching and a community. Coaching, you need two things, coaching and a community. So if you and your husband, you and your wife need some coaching around sexuality, around strengthening love, you, all you got to do is go to theedencircle.com and sign up for our mentor uh, relationship with, with couples. And then secondly, babe, we're going to Jamaica Yay! in June. How yeah. many months is that? Let's see, this is January. Five months five away. Five months. Five, five, five. Everybody say five. So listen, how would you like to go to a romantic island with no kids, only couples, all inclusive, excursions, sunshine, good food, good drinks, uh, workshops on how to strengthen passion and intimacy, how to achieve better orgasms, how to um, what what positions can enhance your sex life, how to communicate better, how to be naked, not just physically, but also emotionally. We're going to talk about all of that. How would y'all like that? Wouldn't you like to come and hang out with us? Question. It's an interesting question. How would you like to come and hang out with Rhonda and I, June the 8th through the 12th, Ultra Reels, uh, at the Couples Towers? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound sexy? Um, I'm telling you, it's going to be one of the most exciting moments in your life. And we're doing marriage vow renewals. So yes. if you want to, if you if your marriage is taking a hit, and you want to come and strengthen, re-strengthen, recommit your vows, we'll do that for you right there on the island. It is one of the most, what's your favorite part of the retreat? That is one of the favorite. And, and then also, I mean, all of it's my favorite, you know, the workshops, being able to talk with couples, getting different perspectives from them, mm -hmm. helping them work through some things. So it's a lot. That's my favorite. Yeah. It's just it's something sexy about seeing my wife glistening under the sunlight with oil all over her body uh, and, and just hanging out with married couples who are trying to stay married. I'm telling you, we got like, what, 40 couples? Mm -hmm. 40 couples. That's 80 people. We're taking over Ocho we're Rio. Take it over. We're taking over Couples Towers and we're going to dance every night. We're going to laugh every day. We're going to love on each other. And it's going to be the most important four nights of your life. So please, if you have not already, mm -hmm. go sign up at drstacylspencer.com and click on the International Marriage Retreat link and register today. And on February the 1st, February on, on February the 1st, we're going to have just an informational, just giving some additional details, some next steps for the retreat that's taking place in June. So you don't want to miss it in the event that you are not already in our Eden Circle or that you're not in our list, on our list, please 
email either Dr. Stacy L. Spencer at gmail.com and let him know that you're interested so that we can send you a the Zoom link. Or you can and you can email me at rfaespencer1 at gmail.com. That's R-F-A-Y-E, the number one, at gmail.com. We want you to go to Jamaica. Your marriage deserves it. You deserve it. Y'all going to travel this year. Mm -hmm. You're going on vacation. Why not vacation with a purpose? Why not party with a purpose? So we can enhance your pleasure and take your sex life to a whole nother level. You haven't had your best sex yet. This is going to be amazing. June 8th through the 12th, Ultra Rios, Jamaica. Sign up now. Well, listen, we have we have had a wonderful time with you tonight. I hope that you will give us permission <laughs> to have deeper. We want we haven't even we've only scratched the surface with the stuff that we want to share with y'all, but we got to get past this initial hurdle of Absolutely. I don't want to hear my pastor talk about sex. You're gonna hear because I love you that much that I got to tell you the truth. Rhonda loves you that much that she wants to tell you the truth. So baby, anything else you want to say before we log off? No, just go on <laughs> and get in our Eden circle. That's the Eden circle.com. Again, that's the Eden E D E N circle.com. All right. We love y'all. Now all y'all go and be free and don't stop allowing people to make you think that you can't hear from your spiritual leaders on what God wants you to have. The gift he created is yours to enjoy. Go and be blessed.